Well, you can open to Titus chapter 1. But as you're finding your way to Titus chapter 1, I'm going to progress through the scriptures and I'm going to read a series of passages that will help us to understand what we are about to embark on. In Romans chapter 10 and in verse 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. A great truth, right? But in verse 14, immediately following this, it says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Hmm. And how shall they hear without a preacher? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and in verse 13 it says, Do ye know, uh, do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple, and they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. In Galatians chapter 6, and in verse 6, it says, Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. In Ephesians chapter 4, and in verse 11, it says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and in verse 12 it says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and in verse 17 it says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 4 it says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. In 2 Timothy 3 and in verse 1 it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, <clears throat> traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, led with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 1, Paul charges Timothy, therefore, to before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, to preach the word, to be instant, in season, out of season, to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, not, not maybe, but will come, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Just a brief comment on that passage. On Friday at the funeral I was talking with a fellow pastor, and he said that, he said most churches when a pastor goes to the church he gets a honeymoon period. He said, I didn't get that at my church. He said, within a few weeks, I went to do a hospital visitation at, to one of the members of the church, a longtime member of the church. And he said, I walked in the door, and the first thing they greeted me with was, I don't like your preaching. And he said, really? And he said, why is that? And they said, because we don't like doctrine. 
You ought to just preach nice things. Why do you have to preach on doctrine? He said, that person has since left his church. And I told him, I said, then you can rejoice in the Lord that they're no longer your worry or stress. If you're going to be an idiot, go to some other church and let that pastor stress about you and leave me to be stress-free. Just a plug for, go to the Catholic church and let the priest worry about you. Hebrews 13 and verse 7 says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. And verse 17 goes on and says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. In James 3 and in verse 1, it says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. And then finally, in 1 Peter 5 and in verse 1, it says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. And then finally in our text, in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Well, we have been studying the first four verses of Titus and the truths that are on display there. We will now move to verses 5 to 9 and consider the truths that are on display there for us. Paul jumps in this passage from his position. Remember what his position was. He is an apostle, which is a sent one, an unrepeatable office. There are no apostles today. And he is a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his position. What is his purpose? He's writing so that things could be set in order, so that they could acknowledge the truth, so that they could live for godliness. And he is writing to who? To God's elect. Who are God's elect? Those people who are the blood-washed band that have been called out from every tribe and tongue and nation. What is he uh, doing? He is preaching. He's preaching to Titus how the church is to function. Who is his partner? Titus. Uh, Titus is a Greek convert of Paul's that Paul leaves on a Greek island to help establish a Cretan church. And there's, have you ever heard the expression, you Cretan? Have you heard that? Uh, Do you know what it means? Some are doing this, some are not so much. It it means that you're kind of worthless, you're, you're, you're no good, you're you're uh, filled with excess. It's not a nice phrase to be called a Cretan. And we saw in, in Titus further down in verse 12 that even a prophet of their own said that the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. And Paul, who had been there, uh, reiterates this by saying in verse 13, this witness is true. <laughs> These are the Cretans. This is what they're like. So he could be talking to us today here in Catani because we often have that same attitude. It's my desire as we go through Titus to deal with some of the important issues that are facing the church today. 
And the, the issue that I think is most pressing in Paul's mind and why he begins with this is the importance of having someone in the pulpit who is deeply in love with Jesus and who is not afraid to proclaim the truth no matter if the truth offends or not. We read in the one passage when pastors are supposed to preach. Did you remember it? Pastors are only supposed to preach two different times. They're supposed to preach in season and out of season. That's the only time we're supposed to preach. <laughs> now, what is trying to be established by Paul, remember he's writing this letter to Titus, but with an intention. He wants Titus to publicly read this in front of the Cretans so that they might hear his words and learn from him. And as he does this, we recognize that God has not left us without a witness as to what a true church should and must look like. And one of the key principles for us to understand from this witness that we have here is the necessity of godly men called to be pastors. And I hope that we can biblically settle this for you once and for all as to the importance of the pastor. Several quotes from men who have long since re been rejoicing at Jesus' feet. Matthew Henry said, A church without a fixed and standing ministry or pastor in it is imperfect and wanting. You see, a pastor is necessary for the perfecting of the saints and the edifying of the body of Christ until Christ comes. John Gill said that the office of pastor is as of greatest usefulness for the good of men and the honor of God as is the doctrines, ordinances, and discipline of the gospel. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the great preacher of the 20th century, said, the work of preaching is the highest and greatest and most glorious calling to which anyone can ever be called. And John Stott, a contemporary of his, said that preaching is indispensable to Christianity because Christianity is based on the truth that God chose to use words to reveal himself to humanity. First he spoke through his prophets, interpreting his actions in the history of Israel and instructing them to convey his message to his people, how? In speech and writing. Then he spoke in his son when the word became flesh and through his son's words, spoken either directly or through his apostles. Thirdly, he speaks by his spirit through his servants who preach in his name. The word of God is thus scriptural, incarnate, and contemporary. This point is fundamental to Christianity, and God's speech makes our speech necessary. We are called to pass on the message we have heard to others. We must speak what he has spoken, or in other words, we must preach. Now, I've read for you several old-timers, and I've read for you what the Bible has to say. And I hope that you can see that these old timers got their conclusions from the Bible. And I do not say any of these things today with any other angle than we're in the book of Titus and this is what's next. We've got to understand the importance of the pastor. And I read many verses dealing with pastors and you can put all of the verses in the Bible that deals with pastors into three different categories. Category one is what God requires in a pastor. This category is always the most daunting for me because it is the one that I see myself most lacking in when I look in the mirror. And it is a constant reminder to me when I read these passages that this is what God has called me to be. It's humbling to be a pastor and to know that this is what your responsibility is. In our little epistle today, we're considering the, the importance of the pastor, but Timothy also expands on this, and we read that passage already, and from those two passages, we can come up with no less than 16 requirements that God has for a pastor. So before a church ever considers what they should require of a pastor, they should first and foremost ask, what does God require of him? 
I remember when I was candidating at one church one time, their requirement for a pastor was that he be 30 years old, have 40 years of experience, have grown and baby children. I read a list of no less than 300 things that they felt would make an ideal pastor. And I thought that 16 was daunting with what the Lord had given. These people apparently felt that they had, you know, a, a higher word than the Lord to come up with. There was a man that I knew uh, that he was filling out a questionnaire to become a pastor, and they had no less than 400 questions on the application for him. And of those 400 questions, he said, very few dealt with doctrine. He said they all wanted to know how many kids he had, you know, this, that, and the other, as apparently those are the most important things to being a pastor. The second category in Scripture that moves beyond the requirements of the pastor is the responsibility of the pastor. The requirements tell us what type of man the pastor is to be. The, re the responsibility tells us what type of work that man is supposed to do. In Romans 10, 13 to 14, he is to present Jesus Christ plainly. In Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, he is to perfect the saints, to be ministers and edify. To edify just simply means to instruct and to improve someone morally and or intellectually. And he is to do this until Jesus Christ returns. 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 4 says that he is to preach the word, whether it is popular or unpopular. He is to reprove people of sin. He is to rebuke people for heresy. And he is to exhort people with patience and doctrine. But it also warns of a time of declension or a falling away from this biblical mandate. And that's what we're dealing with today. We have a declension. We have a falling away. We have people who no longer desire to hear what the pastor has to say. During the time of the Reformation, if you wanted to know anything to make sure that it was right with Scripture, you went to a pastor and you found out what the pastor had to say. And you found out what his opinion was and how he harmonized it with Scripture. Now today, the pastor is just the guy who stands in the front, hopefully preaches a 25-minute message that begins with two jokes, has no more than three points for him, us to remember. And that's what people want. Obviously, you know that you got the short end of the stick with me. In 1 Peter 5, 1 to 5, it shows that pastors are to feed the flock, to oversee them, not because they have to, but because they want to. And they don't do it because they want to make money. They do it because their mind is ready and willing. Pastors are not to do it as kings, but they are to do it as examples. The third category is what God requires of the church in regard to their pastor. In other words, God expects me to care for you, and God expects you to care for me. The first requirement of the church towards their pastor, chronologically speaking, is in 1 Corinthians 9, 13 to 14, where Paul says, using the Levitical priesthood analogy, that God's pattern for the church is to provide for their pastor so that he might be freed to preach the gospel without a secular job. Not to be a layabout, but to be a studier of the word. Spurgeon said, Teaching and bearing rule in the church requires the dedication of a man's entire life to spiritual work and a separation from every secular calling. He says, just as society provides for their soldiers, so too the church must provide for its soldiers. Paul said in Galatians 6.6, 6, that those who have learned from pastors are to communicate to them, meaning to share what they have. He tells the church that they are to esteem or to respect and admire their pastors in 1 Thessalonians 5. Why? Not because of who they are, i.e. charismatic or entertaining or somebody special, but rather because of the office that they hold. You see, if you love your pastor just because he's charismatic or entertaining or something like that, then what you have developed is a cult of personality where you're following the man and not the message. And you've got to be very careful of that. 
In 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 19, he says that not only are they to be provided well for, but you're not to take an accusation against him lightly. In Hebrews 13, 7, he says that you're to live like your pastor lives. And in verse 17, you're to obey him because he watches for your soul and one day will have to give an account for you. And then in James, he picks up the theme saying in James 3, 1, let the pastors be the pastor because he knows that he will be condemned greater for his failures. So we see plainly that God has a requirement for me, a responsibility for me, and a requirement for you, the church, in relation to me. And Paul, when writing to Titus, begins by discussing with him up, up front what, mut, what must be done in the church with regards to the pastor. Sorry, my tongue got wrapped around my eye teeth and I couldn't see what I was saying. Yeah. I should have brushed them this morning. That might have helped. No. <laughs> I digress. Listen, if the pastor is wrong, then the church will be wrong. And if the pastor is weak, then the church will be weak. It's that simple. That's how crucial the position of the pastor is. If you have a pastor in your church that is not preaching the word, that is not communicating the truth of God's word to you, then you have nothing more than a false doctrine that is being expounded to you. And how can you grow and expect your life to be edified or to come to a fuller understanding of Jesus Christ if there is no truth coming out to you? And we have this happening all the time. We have that guy <laughs> with that big grin, that million dollar grin. I wish I had that. And the hair. Huh. <laughs> I re you guys remember what the, uh, my mentor in my academic studies said to Stacy when Stacy, when I messaged him and said to Stacy that or I, I said to him that Stacy was worried with me during COVID when I was doing all of this TV stuff. He said, she said she was worried that she was going to be married to a TV preacher now. And his response was, tell her not to worry. You don't have TV preacher hair. <laughs> you know your friends, don't you? A church that does not have a pastor that is faithfully preaching the word of God will become weak, and the people in it will become weak. This is what astounds me when there are churches that people have been in for generations and who have pastors that preach a, a false or a watered-down gospel, and the people stay for ridiculous reasons. What are some of the ridiculous reasons I've heard? Well, you know, our church has a cemetery, and I want to stay here so that I can be buried in the cemetery. You're dead already! Go find some place to live and let somebody else worry about your body. Amen. Well, this is where my wife goes to church. Take your wife by the hand and say, honey, let's go someplace where the word is preached. Well, this is where mom goes to church. Cut the apron strings. Go where the word of God is preached. And if the word of God ceases to be preached at Grace Baptist Church, then go. Go find some church where the word of God is preached. Obviously, there are steps that you can take first to ensure the fact that the word of God has continued to be preached here. But that would require you becoming a member and becoming active in this church. So I want to clear up for you a couple of things from the text today and also probably next week because we're already out of time uh, on what Paul is obviously trying to speak about. First, this happens after his imprisonment at Rome. He makes a trip to Crete and he's writing to Titus whom he had left behind there. And while Paul was there, he did what Paul does. He preaches the gospel. Everywhere Paul goes, he preaches the gospel because this is his desire. The gospel preached faithfully and used by the Holy Spirit has a, a, a reaction. Do you know what that reaction is? People get saved. And as a result of people getting saved on the island of Crete, there became a necessity. Do you know what that necessity was? 
they had to have a church. Listen, you cannot have saved people and not have a church. Did you hear that? You cannot have saved people and not have a church. When somebody says to you, I'm saved, but I don't think I need to go to church because church isn't all that important, what they are saying to you is either they have a gross misunderstanding of what the Bible has to say, or they're not really saved at all. That's right. Because when you get saved, you fall in love with the church. And you fall in love with the preaching of the word. And so because there are saved people here, it requires them to have a congregation or a gathering together of the local believers. So we could say that you're not saved by going to church, but if you are saved, then going to church is important to you. But the church must be, Paul says, set in order. And in 1 Corinthians 11:34, Paul desires to come to Corinth to set things in order because in chapter 14 and verse 40 of 1 Corinthians, all things are to be done decently and in order. Paul is concerned about there being orderliness in the church. Paul has to leave Crete before he finishes establishing the Cretan church, so he leaves Titus behind. Why? To set things in order. <clears throat> And the first thing that he is required to set in order is the choosing of the elders. Now, just briefly on the term elders, it's the same thing as pastor and bishop. There's no difference. Elder, pastor, bishop, all the same phrase. Used interchangeably even within certain passages. The Greek word for pastor is poimon, which means shepherd. So whether you use elder, bishop, or pastor, you're describing the same office. It's someone who is called by God to care for God's flock in a local church. And so where there is a local body of believers, they are to have an overseer who cares for their spiritual needs or else they are going to be wanting. In the Old Testament, in Jeremiah 3 and verse 15, God says that pastors are a blessing from him. Not everyone can be a pastor, only some are called to this high calling, and these men must be certain types of men. There are 16 things we said earlier, and today we're only going to concern ourselves with Titus's list, and only maybe just one or two. A bishop is to be blameless. What does this mean? Two times it's repeated, so this is obviously a key. Paul says in verse 6, if any man be blameless. Then in verse 7, he says a bishop must be blameless. So we've got to ask ourselves a question. If this is a key, what does it mean to be blameless? Well, obviously it means that your pastor is supposed to be perfect. Right? If you believe that, <laughs> you've not spent more than five minutes with me. But I will say this, oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. <laughs> the young people are all like, what's he saying? The old people are like, oh yeah, I remember that song. <laughs> what's it go on to say? I look in the mirror and see that I get better looking every day. <laughs> Can't wait to look in the mirror. I get better looking each day. Yeah, there you go. Shane knows it. <laughs> 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 Obviously, it cannot mean sinless perfection or else there would be absolutely no pastors. Well, the word itself means innocent of wrongdoing. So what does this mean? It doesn't mean that he's perfect, but it means that he does not live his life in such a way that people can bring railing accusations repeatedly against him. He is not two-faced. What if I preach to you this morning that taking God's name in vain is a sin, and then later this afternoon you heard me taking God's name in vain? That would be a blameless person, or that would be a blameable person, not blameless. You guys know I'm not perfect, but doing that would cause, cause you to call into question my beliefs. You see, the pastor must serve God with as much devotion out of the pulpit as he does in the pulpit. He is to be first and foremost a man of God, not of the people. I cannot speak of heaven with my lips and then point to earth with my actions consistently. Then we move from blameless in personal life to the leadership of family life. A pastor is not only on display, but also his wife and children are on display too. Be careful of a pastor who does not love his wife and children. 
Did you hear this? Be careful of a pastor who does not love his wife and children. And just as equally important, be careful of a pastor who is not loved by his wife and children. Because that speaks volumes as well. Now, there's a one wife deal that Paul puts in here. And obviously, Paul is making it a given that a pastor is to be a man here by mentioning only the term husband. He comes out and says it in 1 Timothy 2.12 that pastors are only to be men. And immediately after saying that in verse 1, he lays out the office of pastor. Now, what does a husband of one wife mean? Well, simply put, I can't be a polygamist. That disqualifies me as a pastor. There are those who would make it so that a man who is divorced uh, cannot also be a pastor. And that's a hill that I don't wish to die on. But another thing that I will say to you is this, is that the Catholic teaching of abstaining from marriage is a false doctrine as well. Pastors are supposed to have wives. Not everyone, but it's the normal process for them to have wives. And for them to abstain from marriage is just to cause problems down the road. Now, I've taken you as far as I think I'm going to take you today. But uh, basically, I've been hunting with birdshot this morning. So let me not jump into the faithful children too far without saying that the pastor's children must be taught in the Lord. Do you hear this? The pastor's children must be taught in the Lord. But I also want to say this. The pastor can no more make his children believers than he can make anyone else a believer. It is just as stressful for a father who is a pastor to make sure that his children hear the gospel as it is for a father who's not a pastor. It is the responsibility of the pastor as a father to lay constantly before his children the importance of being in the word. But I cannot save my children, nor can I save you. That's not under my purview, but rather what I have been given authority to do is to preach the word and to be faithful and to be consistent in it. So how can we conclude? What does the pastor mean to you? Do you have a biblical view concerning the pastor? And if you do... Do you pray for your pastor? I was grateful to talk with Bill Vollmer last evening, and he said, Pastor, I just want you to know that we're praying for you because we know that you're going under or through a lot of things. I'm grateful for this. A Spurgeon was asked one time, what was the key to the success of his ministry? And he simply said, my people pray for me. And that's the responsibility of the church, Amen. to pray for their pastor. We'll jump more into this next week, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll see a few more things. But it is nonetheless a challenge to be a pastor, uh, but it is a wonderful challenge, and I thank the Lord for the calling. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this opportunity to study the Word this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the attentive ears of the people. And we know, Lord, that we moved through this rather rapidly. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be able to uh, take more time next week to be able to study the important role that you have given to this church. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.